Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason, not a normal episode Inman. I'm here by myself and I'm here to introduce yourself to, of course, this is normally the podcast where we take you through one character, construct, or item from popular culture, but this episode's a little bit different. This episode is a live panel that we recorded this year at Stan Lee's LA Comic Con. This is a panel about how to write science fiction based on real science. And we wanted to put it into our podcast because we thought it was a great panel. It has myself, it has Ashley Victoria Robinson, the Action Lab writing team of Jeffrey and Susan Bridges, and uh, Webtoon Darby creator Sherard Jackson. And we're all talking about how we use science fiction into making our books better, making our sci-fi concepts uh, more realistic, if you will. And we thought it was a great conversation, so we wanted to share it with all of our listeners here. Fair warning, there are some audio difficulties. You're going to hear some table bumps. You're going to pro- possibly hear some bumps or some burps and some weird people in the audience. Um, but we still think the conversation is really great. Now, before we get into the regular episode, I do want to remind you all Don't forget, the Jawin comic drive for service members is in full effect right now, and we need to hit our goal of 15,000 comic books before the end of November 30th by giving Operation Gratitude over 15,000 comic books to send to United States soldiers and service members overseas and at home. And you can find all the details for that on our social medias. That's at Jawin for me. And also, we have a website that can answer all of your questions. If you have any questions like, what kind of book should I donate? When does it end? How should I do this? Should I do this? The answer is yes to that. Then go to Jawin Comic Drive for Service Members.com. That's spelled J A W I I N. You can find all the information there. All right. So now let us hop into a live panel about how to write science fiction based on real science. So hello and welcome to our panel on how to write sci-fi, putting real science in your fiction. We're going to go down and in, I don't know, five sentences or less, introduce ourselves and talk about our work. And then we will get into the actual questions. I mentioned this before, but if you do have a question throughout the panel, please feel free to queue up at the mics. We're not going to do hands or anything. We'll answer your questions throughout the panel because you're great and we're great and we'll all be great together. My name is Ashley Victoria Robinson. I am a writer. I co-write with Jason, who's down there on the end. Our debut series, Jupiter Jet, is What If Kim Possible Met the Rocketeer? And our new book, Science, which we have advanced copies of here, uh, explores what if Harry Potter went to a Star Trek school but was a nice Indian-American lesbian. And so for both of those, we had to invent different sciences and technologies, which is what inspired this panel today. So now I'm going to throw to Jason, who's just done all the hard work, and say, tell us about yourself and your work. (laughs) Hi, my name is Jason Inman. When I'm not a part-time audio technician at LA (laughs) Comic-Con, I am a showrunner's assistant on a CBS television show right now, and a podcaster, and um, I don't know, you really threw me under the bus. I'm still trying to think about audio stuff, and I have no idea how to introduce myself. So, hurrah! (laughs) I'm an author as well of Super Soldiers. I I apparently do stuff. I'm sorry, I'm completely lost. Hello. Hello. And next to Jason is Sherard Jackson. Hello, Sherard Jackson. I'm the creator of Darby. It's uh, D-A-R-B-I. Uh, stories about a bloodthirsty dinosaur trying to survive uh, a savage land. And the, w- the best way to describe it is, there's two ways to, de- ways to describe it. It's like a lamp before time meets Pulp Fiction. Or, you know, imagine if uh, John Singleton directed Jurassic Park. So, See, this is L.A., so we all have our elevator pitches ready. Yeah. <laughs> And then next to them are the lovely Susan and Jeffrey Bridges. Who are you and what do you write? Go on. Me? Yeah, you start. Uh, Well, we have our first uh, cyberpunk comic coming out next week. It's called Kill Switch. It's about these people who can see the future that are trapped in a prison on a comet orbiting the sun. So that's fun. And we are also the um, executive producers of Pendant Productions. It's a uh, scripted podcast audio drama company. Uh, we've been making them since 2004, and our 17th show is launching later this month. So you can uh, find all that at PendantAudio.com. And you've won a bunch of awards for that, too. Uh, we have these. Are some of those sci-fi shows? A few. Most of them. <laughs> yeah, most of them shows. are sci-fi shows. Right? Actually, nice. um, eight of our shows are in... Eight. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Eight of our shows are in the uh, Apple Podcast top 60 uh, scripted sci-fi shows. So we've got eight in there, which is pretty cool. Nice. 
So I mentioned this in jest at the top of the show, but it uh, still remains a true fact that none of us studied science. So since we've all entered into the world of writing science fiction, I thought it might be fun if we talked about growing up, what we liked about science or science fiction, and what inspired us to get into that. For me personally, a huge part of that was Star Trek, which I mm. suspect yeah. so many people <clears throat> in this room, including our friend at the back, will also say... And that's something that you'll find a lot of Easter eggs for in our work. Uh, Jason and I, pre-writing comics, also made a 31-episode Star Trek parody web series, which you can still find somewhere online called The Red Shirt Diaries. We like to put... Yeah, it's great. It's really great. Uh, We like to put a lot of Star Trek Easter eggs in our books, and particularly if you do choose, you can find it at theredshirtdiaries.com. I didn't know if that website still exists. Still exists. Um, If you pick up (laughs) science and you are a Star Trek aficionado, you will notice very particular Easter eggs. Um, So that has always interested me more than actual science, and I'm more interested in biological science. And ironically, we created two comic books that are very technologically based. So when we were doing Uh, science specifically, we had to come up with a fuel force or something that could power our thing that will spoil the entire book. And I tasked Jason with discovering that. So Jason, why don't you tell us about that and then tell us about science or science fiction that inspired you to write. So I I kind of believe... So what's the question here? I'm just talking about science, or what, what, are, what are you asking here? <laughs> Talk about the dark energy, and then also if you could tell us about some science or science fiction that has inspired you to be a creative. Uh, it's totally, Star Trek is 100%. Like, Star Trek is the reason why I wanted to be an astronaut until I got into the fourth grade, and uh, my math teacher said, uh, hey, you know you're going to need a lot of math to be an astronaut. I was, I've always been terrible at math, and that immediately crushed my dreams, so <laughs> teachers, tell your children that you could do anything, but... Uh, so Star Trek has always been my thing. Yeah, we do have like a Star Trek Easter egg in everything we write. Also a Beatles Easter egg. Those are deep cuts. Yes. Uh, but we had to come up with, this would be my first piece of advice, is if, you need, if you're going to write science fiction, you need to decide how much are you going to dedicate your story to what actually happens. Now, you can get all kinds of variances of that because on, on the ends of the spectrum there are, like our comic book is sort of an educational comic book. So we sort of have to be legit or everything has to start in some basis of reality. If you can go on the other end, I mean, I don't have a good example for it. I mean... A Star, a star Wars? A Star or Wars. Or even, yeah. even Jupiter Jet where yeah. we just made up power sources. <laughs> what is hyperspace? <laughs> you know, like that, it just works, right? It just gets them from point A to point B. So you're always on the spectrum of like how much to reality are you or how much to complete ridiculousness. But since we were um, educational, we have to be over on this side of the spectrum And we had to come up with this energy source, fuel source that would create basically the complications of the plot. So it had to start in some sort of reality. And it led to me finding NASA's technical manuals on (laughs) rocket fuel. They are dry, allow me to assure you. And reading those (laughs) for eight hours. (laughs) But that led me to the revelation of uh, the big twist of our book, which I will not say what it is in case you guys ever want to read it. Um, But like if I hadn't... if I hadn't done that research, it would have just been fantasy land. It would have just been hyperspace. It just works, whatever. But because I like had this basis of like, oh, this is how NASA sort of does it. So this is how our students should do it. This is how our teachers should do it. A, a sort of basis of reality, which I'd imagine it would probably be the same for like everybody else in this oh, panel. Absolutely. Like it gives you like a good foundation. Absolutely. It's like uh, with me and the dinosaurs. A uh, lot of a lot of paleontology. A lot of study. Study on that end. And the the plus side of that is you know, I've always you know I've always loved robots and dinosaurs you know since the age of four, and like what always fascinated well, what always fascinated with me about that was of course when you're when you're a child you're finding about dinosaurs the first time you know you you see wow those those are monsters wow and then your teacher tells you oh by the way those are real they existed sixty five million years ago, and so your mind just it's, it's fascinating it's fascinating to see so. When you see it initially, you think, okay, well, well, this is a monster. But when you start doing the study of it and you start doing the correlation of how, of how, how animals now, it, compared to what animals would be 65 million years ago, and just the way like the way things evolve, uh, it's you know it's just just a lot of like a it's pretty much like a lot of reverse engineering of like of animals now. It's like, well, if this is a chicken here, then back then when the Earth was like a uh, hotter or whatever, you'd say, okay, well, then the chicken would be a T Rex. 
Because and we, we did joke about it earlier, and I made the comment about uh, a turkey, but yeah. dinosaurs didn't have feathers. And yep. Sherard's comic is the first dinosaur comic that I saw where the dinosaurs had feathers. Yep. And yeah. they so actually it makes looked... You, it makes Darby very unique. Yeah, yep. they looked all, like all the new bodies. anatomical drawings. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. Well, what's, what's funny is like uh, with Darby, they're actually they're what's called like a mesothermic or gigantothermic, which means... Like Can a, you say those again, but oh, a little um, slower? Oh, yeah. It's a mesothermic and gigantothermic. Now you have stuff to Google. Yeah, <laughs> which, which basically means like a, like a, when you're smaller, you you you, you I guess you give off, give off less heat, so you need more temperature regulation, which is why baby dinosaurs have feathers. When they get bigger, uh, you know, their mass kind of regulates their body temperature, so they don't need feathers. Which is why, like a lot of the adult dinosaurs, they, they kind of like don't have feathers except for like plumage. In, in for display See, purposes. you all learned something. Did you I know that? Something. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Susan and Jeffrey, you're doing cyberpunk, which is a very specific type of story. So I'm assuming you not only had to do actual scientific research, but research into that genre. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And I know your specific love of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everyone knows our specific love mm -hmm. of Star Trek. We <laughs> kind of talk about it a lot. Yeah. But no, for, for cyberpunk in general, there are a lot of things I think that annoyed us like about like especially the portrayal of women it's like how is the future so super cool and yet women are treated exactly the same way in all of society and they're still treated that way weird so we were like how about we write a cyberpunk comic that puts women in the front and doesn't have any weird sexual violence or yeah. where there could be sexy lamps and they talked about that on the last panel you if you can Replace your woman with a sexy lamp. Maybe you should think a little bit about that character. And there have been an awful lot of sexy lamps. Mm -hmm. So, but for this particular comic, we actually did start it based on an actual scientific study that was done. And this was about memory and kind of tied into deja vu. Well, and time. And, well, yes. You have to start with the... the no, I a, don't. I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, time, Jeffrey. You don't. <laughs> there's a scientific theory that time is not necessarily linear, that we just experience it that way. It's a, it's a construction of our brains to make sense of the world around us. And so All right, when, Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> so yeah. when you, if you extrapolate out from that, the, the um, basis of the study that we founded our entire comic on was... If time isn't linear, then our memories wouldn't be linear. And so you So don't we somehow have access to all the things? Have access to memories yeah. that technically haven't happened to you yet, but if time's not linear, you that might still it might be in your memory somewhere. But, it's in there. So would that explain like deja vu premonitions? Exactly. Right. And so exactly. right, the whole conceit of our book is if there are people who uh, experience deja vu, there's a sort of a process they can go through that forces them to remember other things that, from the future. And this is used to avoid natural disasters yep. or other things, but they're not given the choice. They're locked up and sort of forced to do this. And so we extrapolated out from that how would society treat them. But That's th awesome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And the reason why that's great is because there's another scientific theory out there that I love, because I, I, I love like part of my love of Star Trek, I love like astrophysics and stuff like that. There's another theory out there that is the idea that Physical things cannot time travel, but consciousness can. Yep. And, da, da, da. and there's all there's an episode of uh, uh, I mean spoilers for a show that came out ten years ago, Lost. There's an episode of Lost that specifically deals with that of a consciousness like hopping through time, but the body like the body doesn't move. It's just his brain. Great. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about science. I know, I know. Science. Anyone, science. we at yeah. any point can jump in with any of our crazy theories because we all spend so much time doing research for these books. I want to ask you about your writing process now and taking all that research and what it's like to translate that into something that is accessible because for me, it is difficult to take the gobbledygook and then condense that down into a paragraph. Or sometimes, like for us, because most of our comics right now are YA, it has to be understandable for someone probably under the age of 16. So without falling into the Star Trek trope of, oh, this is like trying to push a lemon through a keyhole. It's like taking the air out of a balloon. Exactly. <laughs> Can we all kind of talk about how we translate the hard science into the realm of fiction? And we're going to start with you this time. Yeah. Well, I do a lot of the research because I just am addicted to doing research. Like, I'm the first person Googling if you're having a conversation and someone's like, what is that thing? And I'm like, I'm going to check it right out. <laughs> but um, I know for Kill Switch, it was more taking the study as a 
uh, a jump off point versus putting a ton of science into mm -hmm. it. But um, for our television pilot that we wrote, we had to put in a ton of like near future tech and things like that. So I was like, let's go to DARPA. So I, <laughs> I went to DARPA. Can you explain if anyone doesn't know or anyone listening doesn't know what DARPA is? DARPA is like the U.S. government's um, not so secret, secret research, basically. It's where the aliens are. It's yeah. where the aliens are, <laughs> and it's all the technological future stuff. A lot of it is war based, obviously, because that is the country we live in. But <laughs> it's the modern world we live in. It is. Yeah. That is. That is also true. It's so. actually. An, it's a the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Thank so you. you. That's right. It. Yeah. I knew it was people. an anagram, so that's why I wanted to look it up. It is. It was. Yes. Uh, and like uh, Jason mentioned earlier about NASA, there is a lot of, if you're looking at tech specifically, there is a lot of public information that is available from Tons. great organizations. And you'd be, I think you'd be shocked what you can get your hands on in a PDF form. That's the, that's the amazing thing about writing this stuff in the age of the internet, right? Can you imagine the writers of, you know, Star Trek The Next Generation in the early 90s, like their only <laughs> solution was either we have to find a you know a, a technical advisor that actually has done this job, or break out the encyclopedias, or send send yep. a PA to the library yeah, to yeah, find yeah. all the books yeah. on Slipstream. I mean, we can like right. type into Google, yeah, and go right to DARPA's website. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, classic trick. They just pretty much like pretty much made up most of it up. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting because Classic Trek, we're going to talk a lot about Star Trek, <laughs> wound up predicting so much future technology, or perhaps inspiring. But if you yeah. listen to William yeah, Shatner definitely. tell it. It's predicting. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I ask a question, um, everybody in the panel, and anybody can feel free to answer this. We, we keep going to Star Trek, and I think the reason why we keep going to Star Trek is because like, it's such a solid example of using real science. At least, they, like, Everything they do is based on real science with the, to, within a degree, and they've had all these kind of... And, Andre Bormanis, who is now working on the Orville, he started on, I think, Star Trek Voyager. He literally used to work for NASA. And then they hired him onto Star Trek, and now he's a writer. He's an amazing writer. You should definitely follow him on Twitter and everywhere. But anyways, we keep going back to Star Trek. I would love to hear, does anybody out there have a, what would they consider, like a not-so-great example where you're like, oh, man, they did not... I can just tell right out, right from the get go, or th or there's a scene, or even an idea where you're like, oh, nobody looked that up; they just made it up. Oh, um, uh, the show Lex. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, Call her out. Call uh, her out. <laughs> uh, the, I, I love it to death, but uh, but but Farscape. You know, they just they just said, you know, nah, whatever. Puppets. Hey, 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 <laughs> puppets are real. I, Muppets are real. Yeah, Star as the Trek girl with Kermit on her phone. <laughs> <laughs> Though, Star Trek, yeah. What? Well, they Is invent things when they just need to, like inertial dampeners on Self the ship. Self-sealing stem They're bolts. Like, and, and, <laughs> right. Or, or the artificial gravity on their ships. How do they have it? They just do because it makes shooting uh, easier. Uh, mm -hmm. ooh, 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 uh, so, Enterprise solved that. They, they use uh, gravity plates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't watched Enterprise, you must. It is recommended viewing. <laughs> I'm just going to use this opportunity to speak to my personal pet peeve, which Please. is, which happens in everything. But I was actually reading a sci-fi book that takes place in a future, and torture still works as a viable means of getting information. And that's like my biggest. It does not work. It is. Crap. I don't know. Like the beds of your fingernails work. can really hurt if you stuff something up there too hard. <laughs> torture works, girl. <laughs> Um, for me, I think a very bad example is one of the most beloved science fantasy um, franchises of all time, and that's Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Force is magic. It fixes everything. And yep. I love Star Wars. Please don't at me. Um, <laughs> but they, they also play, when you're inventing the rules of your world, you can play faster and looser. Like, I joked, like, in Jupiter Jet, we have three different power sources and you tell them apart because they're three different colors and they do what the characters say they're going to do at the time. And doing something like that can make your world building a lot easier than having to make it grounded in reality. I would love if everyone on the panel could talk about a specific science or fact-based choice that they made that had to ground their realities. So for us in science, everyone lives in more or less the real world in modern times, but we have robots that can function at a human capacity. So that's kind of the top of our public technology. So everything else had to be reflective of the fact that we have talking robots, which are kind of just like Siri on steroids with cute faces. <laughs> yes, or Herbie yeah. on steroids. Um, I want to bounce off that. One of the best things that uh, I think we did, uh, 
Well, yeah, would you mind closing the door back there? Thank you so much. You are a hero, and we love you. I have a prize for you after the panel. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the thing, best things that, that I think we did is um, in science is that we divided our main characters up into their different specialities. So we had a mechanical engineer, we had an advanced uh, physicist, we had a biological engineer. And we had an uh, experimental physicist. Yeah, yeah. So they all, all the main characters had different science uh, focuses. And at the end, when the big kerfuffle happens, um, we had our character Sally, who is a mechanical engineer, and we had to think about, well, what would she do to like fix the problem? And it's like, oh, she's a mechanical engineer. She would build something. Because and, the problem with, with science fiction in particular is it's always we're going to shoot it with the special ray gun. Or we're going to punch <laughs> it in or, the face. Or we're going to yep. fight the sky beam, right? There's always a sky beam in <laughs> yeah. every Marvel so, movie that's yeah. coming down. So to we came up with this idea that she built something to solve the problem instead of fighting the problem. Now, we had a we have a hothead character uh, uh, who's like a, a.k.a. He, Johnny Storm. He's our boy. <laughs> he's our boy, uh, AJ. And we had him be the one that was like, let me at him. But like it didn't make sense. And I remember that was like something that like we kept – coming up against the wall with her where we were like I don't think she would she wouldn't fight the person she wouldn't do that she's not that type of person and then as soon as we came up with um, you know oh she builds this like vacuum cleaner thing that like sort of like a Ghostbusters and, and she that's what she does like it made perfect sense and once we started looking at the characters like that where it's like use their science backgrounds to inform their choices because their choice of focus says something about them as a character mm-hmm. oh yeah uh, it's, as far as like a like 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 science, uh, a real world choice, world, yeah. Uh, well, if I, I, I get two, well, one is you can have two. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, well, well the, the first one, uh, the, the, the series Babylon Five, which back in the nineties, I used to love that show. Love, I, for a brief, brief period of time, I loved it more than Star Trek. <gasps> I, I'll, 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 I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. But, but because you know, in in that world, uh, you know, they had a five year plan, and and it was like uh, the politics of the universe were, were in such where, of course, they, they didn't have a. How the Federation has a prime directive that they didn't have one, of course. So a lot of things in that universe were completely just effed up. It's a little bit more realistic than yeah. Star Trek in a lot of ways. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, realistic. Yeah, but like a what, there is a there's the Starfighter on there. I think it was, I think it was called called the Star Fury. The the their uh, the Earth Alliance's primary like fighter ship. Uh, what it would do is instead of like like Star Wars were flying to a, into a situation, situation like like a jet. It, they would it, they use like Newtonian physics to where they where it would shoot out you know the rock be you know, rock propelled it'd go into a situation it cut off its engines and it'd fire and it'd still be riding its inertia and if there's an enemy enemy behind it it would literally swing on its axis and fight that enemy you know fire at that enemy while riding its inertia away from it and and the first time I saw that on on TV I was like holy holy hell someone got it so you know that's 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 how 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 space how uh, space conflict would look that and also their enemies were called called the shadows. They use what was called non Newtonian physics because they were they were essentially you know, organic aliens and they they were born in space. So they so the laws of physics wouldn't wouldn't necessarily apply to them. But the way that they, they use their well, it wouldn't apply to them the way it applies to us. But but the way that they, they use their fighters was they'd clump their fighters together on on a ball or on a spike. They'd shoot it into the middle of a fleet and then all those fighters would just burst off the center and start attacking the fleet from from inside. And I was like, "That's interesting because that's because that shows asymmetrical warfare in space, mm-hmm. which and, is something Star Trek is really bad at." Yeah, yeah. Everything. Every, <laughs> remember, you look at every Star Trek show; it's all about ship here, ship here. And in Wrath of Khan, they defeat Khan because they think in three dimensions. Again, yeah. space is every like the direction. chess game. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Spock. Oh, 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 okay. I got a question for, for 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 both of you. Absolutely. Okay. 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 The uh, the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Like I was, I was say, like of course, like you know, Kirk. Kirk cheated to like to win the test, basically. He did cheat. Okay, I I I think I've, I have have the uh, have the solution to Kobe Ashimaru. It's the car the Picard maneuver. <laughs> not the Riker maneuver. It's not just stepping over your chair. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, let's let's get let's get real nerdy here. Okay, okay. Do we the, can we can someone the co- please explain the oh, Kobe Ashimaru? Oh, yeah. uh, Jeffrey and Susan, do you want to explain the Kobe Ashimaru? Yeah, please. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game of yes and. Um, <laughs> The Kobayashi Maru is the the game from it's 2009 Star Trek and Wrath of Khan where it's this idea that there is a ship called the Kobayashi Maru. It's got a bunch of civilians on it. It is being attacked by three Klingon ships, I think, and you are all by yourself. How do you rescue the ship? That's the test. And there's no 
solution really to it. The idea is like, how do you deal with defeat? It's a test of character yeah. more than anything. Um, the Picard maneuver is a maneuver that Captain Picard came up with in The Next Generation, where basically it's like he moved so fast with the ship that it made yeah. it look like there were two ships there. It, 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 it's, it's a short warp. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, how would that win the Kobayashi Maru? Well, here's where it would work. You get three ships, right? Uh, so you're going to going in to save to save the Kobayashi Maru. The three ships are, are are like angling around you, so you do a short warp behind them when they start firing at you. Okay. So what they're firing you on is your position where you were. So once you're behind them, their shields are down. You start firing on them. Why are their shields down? Because they have they're to fire, fire you. at you. No, the shield. You can have shields up and still fire. Well, you'd still be weak. shields are one direction. You'd, you'd still be weak from behind though. <laughs> I call shenanigans. <laughs> no, it would work. The Kobayashi Maru is a character See, test. See, whatever explanation we gave would not have been good as the one Look forward game, to our panel next year. How to win the Kobayashi Maru. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the panel uh, Real Military Tactics. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Gerard, I want to ask because uh, you know you brought up the Newtonian and non-Newtonian uh, tactics and you do have a lot of fights in Derby. Yeah. Which do you abide by in your dinosaur fights? Uh, dinosaur fights, it's... Uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's behavior or, mm -hmm. or behavioral patterns like uh like 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 herd herd uh, herd movement also uh, like a uh, pack strategy. Can you talk a little bit about herd movements and pack? Oh, yeah. oh, That's yeah, very yeah. different from what we're doing with our uh, oh, magic yeah. robots. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like a <laughs> in like a, if you if you if you look at nature, anytime anytime like a predatory species attacks a herd, they're always gonna go for for the for the weakest or or for the sickest or just or the smallest because that's that's the easiest. You know, that, that's that's easy easiest prey. I feel very yeah. called out right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, 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 the the idea, is, well, because like uh, if you're predatory species, you're not you're not there to just kill for the sake of killing. You're there because y you have to eat. So what's what's going to be better? It's going to be make more sense to to like separate separate the weakest or the smallest from that herd and attack that rather than attack the herd head on, because the herd as a group it's going to kill you, and you're you're going to lose. You're going to lose the fight all the time. So, like in in Derby, a lot of the times, a lot of the predators do like they'll either they'll either scavenge because it's easier to scavenge because you know, there's no fight to it, or they're gonna like we're gonna like like separate like a uh, smallest and weakest from that herd, or they're gonna do something to split that herd up to where to where they can <clears throat> see me to where they to where they can get at the at the smallest ones, and in you in the the series itself, uh, how to explain this. Uh, I also have it to where, to where you know the predators and, and the prey they have to have have a certain accord, because as it is, it's how to explain it. It's like, you know, it's it's not twenty four hour murder in the series. <laughs> it's not. It feels like it. There's a lot of actually very sweet moments, especially oh, yeah. recently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and that that only comes because like uh, even in nature, the when predators and when predator and prey are together, they're not constantly like running and killing each other. It's it's pretty much like like how they relate to each other in in their level of comfort, especially especially around like water sources, you know like you'll see like a lot of animals together to, to get a drink because you know they're both thirsty and they're both not hungry at the time, and also when they're when they're together it's you know if their level if their level of comfort is a certain point then then they're all pretty much tame around each other. So that's what I try to try to put in Darby. Thank you, head professor of biology, Jackson. <laughs> well, thank you. Jeffrey and Susan, is there a specific piece of technology that you have in Kill Switch or a moment that was inspired by real science research? Other than the main concept of time and memory mm -hmm. not being linear, no. <laughs> because we felt that was such a heady concept. We didn't really want to put too much else into it at mm -hmm. the same time. Um, and it took us, I mean, we don't, you don't want to do a giant exposition science dump in the first issue either. So it's sort of explained slowly over the course of the miniseries. So it's, I mean, we've had to get so much of that out there to make the story work and make sense that we didn't want to overload it with too much more. So I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up about science fiction writing in particular, because it is a delicate balance. Um, and like I talked about condensing down content earlier between introducing your idea and executing it in a way that is digestible for your audience member. Jason, yeah, you're I, making strong eye contact. Yeah, so <laughs> I want to talk about that. Jeffrey just brought out something interesting. I, I think we should all have a conversation about this is we should talk about when you're writing real science into science fiction, exposition. Exposition <sighs> the e -word. is the nightmare of most writers. Not for me. I don't know why <laughs> writers hate it. 
Um, I, you know, it's like it's like when writers say the idea that like, oh, you can't write Superman; he's too difficult. I'm like, you, then you're a bad writer. Sorry. If you don't know, if you're unfamiliar with Jason, Jason's favorite hero is Superman. Yeah. Um, so like to me, exposition is it, it's t- it is difficult to write, but it's I'm bad so it. necessary. Mm-hmm. But um, and, and does everybody in the audience know what exposition is? I, I assume like we're, we we live in a world of such <laughs> streaming and, and, and intelligent audiences that I, I was I just want to make certain that mm-hmm. everybody does. It's basically you know where characters explain stuff, um, and that is a trope of science fiction. You basically need it because you have to explain why your magical technology works. And some people do it really well. Some people do it really badly. So I would love to hear from all the amazing, awesome writers on the panels. Um, what are some tips and tricks you've used to get that exhibition out there? Now, we in science had a, had a perfect trick in that we designed a robot that could break the fourth wall and literally give you exposition. <laughs> he waves at you. Yeah, he like literally <laughs> interrupts the story. There is a Love different it. panel, and he goes, hi, let me tell you about that thing that they were just talking about. Boop, 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 boop. You know? um, and so we called them, his, our robot was named STAT, which is the Science Technical assist, uh, assist, Assistant Teacher? Yes. Science Technical nice. Assistant Teacher. Um, and so he would come in and be like, hi, I got a STAT fact for you. The, this thing they're talking about is actually, right yeah. Is actually complete BS, you know. <laughs> uh, and he also, we also like tried to write him like Alfred from Batman, where he would always like throw in like a quick quip about the 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 human students because he doesn't like them very much, um, you know, because they're annoying teenagers. But um, one thing that I found, if you're writing science fiction or science fiction exposition into dialogue, for me, it seems like the thing, like an easy trick, is to have two people have an argument about it. Like if you have a character that doesn't understand it or if the science gobbledygook thing is, if one of the characters doesn't want to do this science gobbledygook thing and the other character does, you can have that character that wants to do it basically give out all your exposition and it won't feel like, yes, the uh, warp engine runs off dilithium crystals because it has plasma drive and this and this and this. It can be like, no, we need to do the hyperspace thing because it's going to get us to Alpha Centauri like as fast as possible. And the and the squid people live there, and the, you know, and then it it, it it jazzes it up a little bit. But we, we also had another yeah. easy trick because we set ours in a school, so there yeah. are, there's a power structure where somebody's yeah, yeah. always explaining to a different audience analog what's going on but yeah what are some tips and tricks everybody for that yeah exposition argument trick is exactly what we did yeah. uh, in <laughs> two different issues in this four issue miniseries but i think another trick is also to not do it all at once yeah it doesn't all have to yep. come yeah. out at the exact same time do it in little bits so that's why like if you read our our miniseries you're not gonna know everything about why this is happening or why it works in issue one but by the time you get to like the end of issue three you should have a pretty good understanding of it so it's you have to piece it out and keep it natural and an argument is a great way to do that because people but also ashley brought up a really important point and this is because we're writers (laughs) you might even have to go further back and set up your story with someone who is in a position to explain things yes that you you're going all the way back to the very beginning it's not just so simple to be like well i need to get all this info across you might have to change the entire way you put your story together to have that person and a lot of stories are structured like that where there's that one guy who doesn't know anything who came from who was frozen and they found him on that Star or that Trek one episode. ensign yeah, yeah. The, uh, one of the best examples he was frozen since 1968 yeah. one of the best examples of that is. one of the best examples of that you might not even realize it is that they're um, in the first Hellboy movie there's that agent I can't remember his name yeah 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 oh the cute guy because he's not in the second movie <laughs> yeah but he's in the first and he's only in that movie basically he, he, to he walk a, around and yeah, be like who's Hellboy <laughs> yeah yeah I mean uh, like uh, what I do I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm an artist before I'm a writer but, but, but so I'm more of a visual storyteller but what I what I have to do is I have to show I have to show instead of tell and like uh, I, which is I, why you're gonna sell Darby to be a TV show or a movie faster yeah, than the rest of us yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah but like uh, but but for me it's it's all, it's all about pattern recognition it's like uh, I'll have like I'll have the dinosaurs they'll, they'll say they'll say a certain thing or they'll refer to some something as, as a particular thing for example like a uh, I get better at it now, but like in when it, instead of saying like I'm talking at you, they'll say something like I'm quacking or I'm chirping, chirping at you, because you know that's they're really like birds, you know, tweet and chirp. So, so but you, you do that repeatedly over the course of the series, and then the audience says, oh okay, I get it. And also like uh, when I did a when I did sci I did some, some sci-fi books uh, years back, I did a giant robot series, and like a lot of 
Well, like, like a lot of what I would do there to kind of explain the tech, explain the world was you pretty much like just show, like just show, show it in action. Well, like a well, why does the robot walk? Okay, well you look at its waist, it turns this way, and like the the pins come out of its legs and everything. So you're like, okay, as an audience, when you see that repeated, you're like, okay, that's what that means, and that's why that's happening. I think that's interesting that you brought up showing instead of telling because that's an advantage that we have writing for comics specifically versus yeah. writing for Jason has a prose book there at the end or writing for television or writing for movies like comics are so great because comics are movies with an unlimited budget as yes. long as your artist yep. likes drawing horses or buildings <laughs> or ray guns or whatever it is that you're focusing on you can do whatever you want kind of without fear of reprisal as long yeah. as you market it correctly in the end so because you are the only artists or the only professional artist on this panel could you talk <laughs> a little bit about like the designs of your dinosaurs and how you use that in your storytelling okay oh yeah uh that that's dinosaur anatomy that's 101 all, 101 that's always fun <laughs> uh it, it's like a of course you know you, you said you're studying like a, like paleontology using like fossils as examples and also using like a you know again with with the birds and also uh i'd say birds and, and elephants for for like like the sauropods, you know the, you know the the, the you know, brontosauruses, the big dinosaurs, <laughs> yeah, yeah, any any you know, and just like a, and just it's for for me it's kind of like it's almost a lot like like a one to one in as far as as far as like the the body structure goes, like with the T Rexes, of course you know it's gonna be be a chicken, okay, well this is what the structure would be, well based on that, based on the length of it, this is what the muscles look, so this is how the muscles. Can I, can I ask you a follow up on that? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just very curious. Everything you're saying is so fascinating. Do you ever? Um, like take a picture of those animals and then try to like, I, I oh, mean, oh, yeah. I, I, I have no better word for this. So please take no offenses. Oh, oh, like oh, yeah. trace over it kind of like oh, oh, yeah. to oh, get the shapes. Oh yeah. yeah. Like uh, when I first started this, the series, like a, a lot, especially like a, like a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the raptors and everything in yeah. the series, I, would, I trace, you know, I'd start by, by tracing like, like, like the fossils of them. Is there a better term for that? I did. I, I oh, tracing well, sounds like so. Well, fat. Using oh, it as a reference, I guess. Reference, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reference, yeah, there we go. Thank well, you. Yeah. It's like a like a lot of the like a lot of. Like, we all trace stuff growing up. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, like, like a lot of theropod, the theropods, like a, the theropods are, are the two legged dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the theropods, like a like like the like the ornithomimuses and everything, that's that's pretty much like like, like an ostrich. So I reference an ostrich, reference how they run, you know, reference their their. You know, their gait and everything, so so I do that, and also with with the uh, with the main characters, mm -hmm. of course we you know that's you know, we can say oh that that's chicken, well, well well how does the chicken walk? Okay, well okay that makes sense, of course so kind of like base it off of that, and also just just like the just just, just the feathers and the way the way they flow, and also also the coloration. You know. Are your colors? Oh, my colors. Oh, yeah. Specific? Are they oh, anatomically they are. correct? Because uh, you use a lot of very bright, striking oh, yeah, they, colors. They, they are, yeah, because because like a uh, in in with birds, it's it's all about it's all about the colors, it's all about being flashy, and of course like a uh, the flashiest ones in in nature and in the series are are, are the males because they have to they have to attract the the, the females to, to to mate. So like a uh, you that that's and that's all. Also, that's why the lead characters in the series are are male. Because you know that their coats would be would be they're the most colorful. Yeah, be more yeah. colorful, more thicker. I wish everything. our world was like that. <laughs> you guys got to step up, be That's more right. colorful. Yeah, be all, hey, 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 uh, we were back in the eighties. Could you put it? feathers in your hair? I'd really appreciate <laughs> it. Glam <laughs> metal. We, we, we tried. <laughs> Um, as we're winding down, I would love to talk about every writer's favorite tool, which is something that I'm very bad at. Once you've done all this research and you feel like you have a good handle on your characters and on your tech, let's talk about outlining. And Ooh. Susan kind of alluded to this earlier. When you're putting in a lot of exposition or you do have a twist, sometimes you have to seed that really, really early. And we discovered that we had to reference characters, we had to reference conflicts, or we had to reference dark energy mm -hmm. uh, very early and earlier than we initially anticipated. So can everyone talk about what their planning process is before they get to writing? Because I only learned how to outline because I write with Jason and Jason <laughs> likes to plan things. I'm an obsessive outliner, sorry. Oh. I'm obsessive. I will not even let us write one page oh. until we have it all. Like, I like, I do some. It just depends on the project. Like sometimes there's a project where you you can just free flow. You can just go and you can do it. But I find that you're better off if you just plan out everything, everything to the to the minus detail. Because even when you get mm -hmm. to script, you can change it there because you know inspiration hits or whatever. But you've got to know like 
how does your theme interact with your exposition? How does your exposition interact with your characters? And like, you need to like sort of set up your blocks so you can knock them all down because that way they'll tumble and you can yell Jenga. <laughs> so many references combined that don't make any sense. You, you should just hear Jason in his office going Jenga, Jenga, Jenga over and over again. <laughs> Uh, you'd put all you'd put your blocks all together so you can tumble them all down and say Jenga. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, how does your theme interact with your exposition? Wait, does he answer that? Oh, I, so it's the idea of like you need to plan everything out so that you, your themes can interact with your exposition, they can interact with your characters, can interact with your dialogue because everything should be tied. There shouldn't there nothing in your story should be accidental because you're God. You're the god of your story. You or a choose, goddess. Or, or goddess, a non-binary Yeah, I took, it, I took it as a non-binary <laughs> god. Uh, um, it's, it, yeah, it should all interact. Because if it just happens, then it's just a series of unrelated events. Or it's a series of events, which is not a story. And I'm very guilty of saying, this would be really cool. Yeah. Let's do it because it's cool. Yeah, Ashley will get mad at me because every time <laughs> she says that, I'll be like, but why? Yeah. <laughs> Because that that's cool is not a good enough answer, and uh, and we all in this room know we've seen the movie, we've seen the television show, we've read the comic where you can tell that the idea of this was just somebody in a room being like that'd be cool, and that was the end of the thought. Yep, sure. And, when, and when something can go in service of the theme or in service of the idea or the character or whatever is the focal point in the case of most people on this panel, something scientific, it comes together probably stronger. Yeah, if you can use the science. To like back up your theme, it really helps. Like we call our like the subtitle of our book showed up late, but like our book was always about this, like the elements of dark energy. And if you know about dark a little any of the scientific research about dark energy, you know that we don't know nothing about it. But also Which makes it a great device. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it also is like this thing that it's it's very coveted. It's very something that like a lot of people want to figure out because if they think we can figure it out, it'll like unlock all these secrets. So our main character is a girl who is um, she only came to the school because of her or of her dead father and her dead father is talking to her inside of her hologram glasses like he recorded his brain he put it in her glasses so it's like the dad is there so her dad is very much like almost um, sort of an analogy for dark energy she's he's this thing that she wants so desperately she wants to make him so proud and she wants to bring him back to life and figure him out and she knows that if she can do it everything will work out so it's like we use, like, when we say it's the elements of dark energy, like, it's the elements of the character as well. Like, it's very similar. Jeffrey and Susan, you're another writing team. Talk about your outlining and thematic process. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, we definitely do outline. Probably not, like, religiously. Like, I But would, you're doing time and space travel. I know. <laughs> I would rather probably we outline more <laughs> tightly, but I don't think you would let me. <laughs> we, we outline pretty extensively, but we keep it kind of loose, sort of like a general idea of what happens scene to scene, but not, we don't plot it out exactly note for note. Yeah. And I think each project we've done, we've done a little different, like as Absolutely. we test out different methods and things like for our pilot, I know we, we started that with the characters and their relationships to each other, which really kind of kept it really grounded in an interesting way where like this character knows this character in this way. And this character knows this character in this way. Um, and I think also that was a really good point about letting your characters like figure out the, the mm -hmm. problem that you're having. Cause um, I know for our pilot we were working on, we had like this kind of monstrous thing in there and someone commented that it didn't seem like it fit because so much of our stuff was technological and this seemed less technological. And so then we were like, okay, that kind of makes sense. And we started making it a more technological kind of monster thing. And then we were like, hey, we have a character right here who's really good at technology we should use it. <laughs> that would be great. So like the point is though that you have to get it set up in a way that you are able to make those kind of decisions within things the characters would actually do mm -hmm. and things that also fit within their character. Like, All right, Gerard, with no masters to answer to, oh, yeah. what's your outlining process like for Darby? Uh, uh, outline? Yeah. No, this, uh, <laughs> my, my outline, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's rough. It's, it's really rough. <laughs> Again, because I'm I'm a, I'm a visual storyteller. Are you more of a storyboard planner? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's like a I would, like I always plan like a lot of key key action beats, and but 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 like for me like I always make sure I have like like an overarching outline, in in the sense of like saying like well in this season I know like uh, it gets from A B to C, 
okay, so so what are the spots in between A, B, and C? Okay, well, this is one, this is two, this is three, and these are how the episodes break down. And from, from there, like, a, me personally, I keep my own, like, a loose because cause I'm, I'm, a, I'm like you, I'm a moment, moment of inspiration person, but but I will make sure that it, that it kind of it kind of fits within, like, within that structure. So, like, I just make sure that, like, a, that by the time I get to the actual episode, I, I can, you know, I, I know that, like, for, for the next 50 or so panels that this is the story I'm going to be telling. And, and I always, always do the dialogue last because... Because, because again, you you can you can like change details as you need to, so so that, that's that's how I do it. Okay, we just got our nice wave from the very generous gentleman in the back. Does anyone have any questions before we wrap up and let you know where you can find us at the rest of the convention? No, we crushed it. Yeah, oh, <laughs> oh, go to the mic, please. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, when you were talking about exposition, mm-hmm. I've noticed that in a lot of fantasy and uh, sci-fi based stories, a lot of writers like to have a character that's not a native to that world mm-hmm. enter in, which is kind of like a simple trick. Avengers does that too. That's mm-hmm. Captain America. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah you're, that's your audience POV character. Yeah. Exactly. But for like a more hard sci-fi series where there is no character, it just like magically appears in that world. Where is your starting point to relate it to the audience? I, I, I go for it. I think um, that character's there. You just don't think it's there. Mm-hmm. Now you could say it's like some weird space world mm-hmm. that's not our universe. Okay, I guarantee you one of those characters has less experience or is the rookie yep. than the other one, and that's your audience character. Oh, a uh, 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 Blade Runner. Yeah, Cause, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah. Deckard, like he's he's the oddest point of view. He's, he's the protagonist, of course. But the idea is like he's coming back into this particular job. You as the audience, you're like, well, what is this job? Yeah. Well, the person comes comes up behind him and says, hey, you're you're Blade Runner, you're a detective. We need you back on this assignment. Yeah. So of course, with the series, you're learning bits of bits about this about the case as he's learning it. Yeah. Gen- like, generally, that character is there. Yeah. yeah. It's just a little more subtle and less obvious than yes, I'm the bard who has strolled into this tavern for the yeah. first time. Please well, tell right, me about yeah. your society. But, it, but for like, if you were writing it, like the easiest way to think about it is just exp- just look at your characters and be like, who has the least amount of experience? Mm-hmm. That's like Frodo Baggins in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, it's Frodo. Or He's it's, very innocent. It's like any yeah. ensign on a ship in Star Trek who just got assigned to the ship yeah. and they've never been there it's before. Wesley Crusher. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> God bless Wesley Crusher. <laughs> Shut up, Wesley. <laughs> There's also another way, and I th- this comes from, I know John Rogers has said it, and that he says that every character you have should be able to do something that no other character can do. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's a really cool thing because it gives everyone something that no one else has. And then if everyone's an expert in their own thing, well, no one else knows as much as that person about the thing, mm-hmm. and that's your way in too. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, it was. Thank you. All right. We only have a few more minutes left, so we're going to start at the end of the line with Jason. Tell people where they can follow you online, where they can get whatever it is that you have to sell, and where they can find you for the rest of the day. Um, So we have, first off, we have. if you like this panel, we have two more panels. Uh, That's later today as I pull up the graphics very awkwardly. Uh, One Um, of them is at 1, and one of them is at 2. So we have our Geekers Justin Live, which is at 1 p.m. today in room 306AB if you want to see more of us. And then we also have Indie Comic Secrets, How to Run a Successful Kickstarter, which is in the same room, 306AB, at 2 p.m. I'm everywhere online at Jawin. That's J-A-W-I-I-N. Super Soldiers is on Amazon right now. Uh, Science is for pre-order on uh, Amazon right now, and Jupiter is on Amazon as well right now. But we also have copies, so if you, if any of this sounded interesting, like our science comic sounds interesting, come up, talk to me after the panel, uh, and you can literally buy a comic directly from us. So, uh, yeah. Gerard? Okay, well, later today, around 3 p.m., I'll be signing at the Webtoon booth. So come out, come out and see me. I'll be signing with the uh, creator of uh, Winter Moon. And, so, and also, you can find me... Online at a Sherard, my handle is Sherard U R. It's S H E R A R D Y O U A R E. You can find me there through Instagram, Twitter, uh, maybe Snapchat, uh, Facebook, also also YouTube. So Snapchat, you're so hip and with oh, it. Oh, oh, right? also, also I forgot to, forgot to mention uh, the you can find the the comic on the at Darby Comics. It's, <laughs> That's yeah, a big one. I'm also forgot to mention that. One. It's it's a uh, it's, uh, you know DarbyComics.com. It's uh, D A R B I Comics.com. Jeffrey and Susan. 
Well, I'm at Susan L. Bridges on Twitter and Instagram, and I don't remember. Are you just Jeffrey Bridges? Mm-hmm. On okay. Yep. Jeffrey Bridges, no middle initial, oh, no. not the famous one. <laughs> and where can people find Kill Switch? <laughs> Kill Switch is coming out through Action Lab. The first issue is coming out Wednesday. And um, we also run pendantaudio.com, so you can check out our podcast there or anywhere you get podcasts. We are on iTunes, etc. cetera. Uh, you can find me at Ashley V. Robinson. The V is very important. Uh, you can get any of our comics from us here right now. We don't have a table. Or you can uh, get them later from the magic that is Amazon. Thank you so much for coming. Would someone please come forward, take my phone, and take a photo of us all together, yep. and then we will clear out of this room. <laughs> <laughs>